In the midst of the Second World War, amid the vast expanse of the Pacific, a young Lieutenant John F. Kennedy found himself at the helm of PT-109, a moment that would define his naval legacy. As the story of the boat's disastrous mission has been told and retold, questions persist. Was this tragic event a result of Kennedy's leadership, or were the cards already stacked against him by larger, uncontrollable forces? Today, we delve into that fateful night to determine whether the PT-109 incident was truly JFK's fault. The events of the dark night of August 1st and 2nd, 1943, when the Japanese destroyer Amagiri ripped through the PT-109, have perpetually ignited debate over the details. Was John F. Kennedy's perceived lack of action that allowed the 109 to be hit a manifestation of poor leadership, or was it simply a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time? Evidence from one of JFK's former comrades suggests that neither of these hypotheses may entirely capture what unfolded that fateful night. Embedded within this evidence is an even more startling suggestion. Kennedy and possibly one of his crew members might have intentionally obscured the truth. Most investigators of this incident agree that Kennedy had only about 10 to 15 seconds to react to the incoming Amagiri. It is reported that he ordered full speed to the engine room and made a 30 degrees turn to starboard, towards the destroyer, aiming to present a smaller target and potentially prepare a torpedo counterattack. However, because of the limited time, the destroyer struck before these maneuvers could be completed. However, if one trusts the account of PT boat veteran Ted Robinson, the belief that Kennedy's emergency actions failed due to insufficient time may be misguided. Robinson, like Kennedy, had lost a boat in the summer of 1943. In a December 1999 article in Naval History, he asserted that Kennedy confessed to him several weeks after the collision that his initial reaction on seeing the approaching Amagiri was to speed up, but he overlooked in the ensuing chaos that his engines were muffled. Kennedy allegedly indicated that his failure to open the flaps of his mufflers before accelerating resulted in the engines stalling, leaving the 109 vulnerable when the destroyer rammed into her moments later. To understate it, this revelation is sensational. Did Kennedy, in a moment of terror, overlook the standard procedure and stall his boat, thereby leaving it open to be hit? Is he solely to blame for the loss of the PT-109? Partially, the answer depends on the trustworthiness of Robinson's account. His article suggests he cherishes his wartime connection with the late president, which negates the possibility that he made up his account to tarnish his former comrade, and his narrative does bear a certain believability. It's not difficult to imagine the inexperienced young captain, recognizing his peril, forgetting to open his muffler flaps in his hurry to increase his boat's speed. However, the main issue here is not credibility, but historical correctness. Robinson's claim that Kennedy confessed to him, Robbie, I failed to open my flaps, presents a substantial problem. Principally, it was not Kennedy's job, nor his authority as the captain, to open the flaps himself. In a PT boat, similar to larger vessels, the bridge communicates with the engine room via an engine telegraph. When the captain adjusts the engine controls, he is visually instructing the motor machinist's mate, or motor mac, by the engines to slow down, speed up, put the engines in reverse, and so forth. The motor mac is also responsible for operating a lever connected to the engine mufflers located outside the hull on the transom. This lever opens or closes the butterfly valves of the metal flaps that seal the muffler exhaust port. These metal flaps were designed to divert the loud exhaust downwards into the water when the boat was operating at low speeds, such as during patrols. If the PT needed to accelerate to about 10 knots or more, the motor mac had to open the flaps to handle the extra exhaust. Failing to do so could cause the exhaust to backfeed into the engines and cause them to stall. Fundamentally, this is what Kennedy confessed to Robinson had transpired that night. He was patrolling at a leisurely pace of six knots. Upon spotting the destroyer, he increased the throttle. This signal should have prompted the motor mac to first open the muffler flaps. However, it seems this step was skipped. Instead, the throttle on the engines was directly increased, causing them to stall and leaving the boat vulnerable to the rapidly incoming Amagiri. All of this suggests that the unfortunate incident was largely the motor mac's error, not Kennedy's. So why did Kennedy tell Robinson that he had failed to open the valves himself, apparently deeply regretful for not doing so? The Robinson article does not attempt to answer these questions or discuss the implications of the confession, 
The piece merely states that Kennedy was concerned about how others, years after the war sitting in a comfortable, well-lit room back in Miami Beach, would interpret the event and attributed his failing to the natural chaos he faced during the crisis. Given this context, Kennedy's confession of not opening his flaps is bewildering until it becomes clear that he is not admitting fault, but taking responsibility. Like any sea captain, Kennedy was liable for everything that happened on his boat. What Kennedy essentially told Robinson was that he was ready to privately accept that responsibility, even though it was technically his Motormax mistake. However, Kennedy seemed hesitant to publicly admit this error. After all, a mistake made by a crew member was ultimately his own failure, and therefore, from both a personal and official naval perspective, his burden to bear. Assuming that Kennedy naturally wanted to avoid such official reproach may help untangle a puzzling mystery. This mystery is not only raised by Kennedy's alleged confession, but also by long-standing inconsistencies in the written records regarding the ramming incident that have been long overlooked. The conundrum hinges on the question of whether Kennedy accelerated when he first spotted the Amagiri coming towards him. If he did not signal the engine room to speed up, there would have been no need for the Motormac to open the flaps. Therefore, a lack of signal implies no failure in opening them. Without such a failure, neither man could be blamed for causing the engine to stall and consequently leading to the collision. On the other hand, if Kennedy did signal for increased speed, both men would have been culpable for the Motormax response. So did he send a signal to the engine room or not? The immediate action Kennedy should have taken upon spotting the destroyer was to accelerate. It's irrational to believe that he wouldn't take such a basic, self-preserving step. And later, when critics questioned his and his crew's alertness, it would have been beneficial for Kennedy to point to the throttle increase as a sign of his decisive action during the critical moment. Yet remarkably, he never officially or publicly acknowledged having sent a signal to increase the speed in the engine room. The official Naval Intelligence report on the collision, penned by Byron White and dated August 22, 1943, only describes Kennedy steering the wheel to starboard in preparation for launching a counter-strike, but it does not mention any acceleration. Similarly, Kennedy's own after-action report does not include any reference to a request for more speed. Instead, he plainly stated that he couldn't dodge the Japanese destroyer, as only one of his engines was in operation. In Survival, an article by John Hersey published in The New Yorker in June 1944, Kennedy simply asserted that he turned the wheel to mount an attack, but the 109 responded sluggishly. When interviewed by Robert Donovan for the book PT-109 during 1960-61, Kennedy again discussed turning the wheel, but did not mention any communication with his Motormac. The enigma deepens. Pat Pappy McMahon, the Motormac in question, consistently backed up Kennedy's public version of the incident. McMahon, a teacher in Southern California in his late 30s at the time, was severely injured in the collision and was the man Kennedy famously towed to shore for five hours the next day. He first appears in Hersey's New Yorker article where he informed the author that he had no idea what was unfolding before the collision. In other words, he received no instruction from the bridge prior to the incident. In 1960, when Donovan also interviewed McMahon for his book, McMahon repeated his unawareness of any impending danger and that he was merely conducting routine engine checks when the destroyer struck. In other words, he consistently feigned unawareness of any signal from Kennedy. So did Kennedy in truth not signal the engine room as both he and McMahon publicly maintained? This seems unlikely. Many authors sympathetic to JFK seem to assume that he did signal McMahon to speed up, although none has provided a source for such a claim. Others less favorably disposed, including some former PT officers, wondering how he could have allowed a destroyer to ram his agile PT boat, have proposed that Kennedy made an error in sailing with the engines muffled. They conjecture that when Kennedy spotted the Amagiri, he instinctively went full throttle and the engine, or engines, either choked severely from exhaust backflow or failed completely. One former PT commander, William Liebenau, even speculated that perhaps the motor machinist below was not fully attentive. I think that when Kennedy adjusted the throttles, if he adjusted them, they didn't respond. Nothing happened. The most persuasive evidence that Kennedy did accelerate comes from someone who was very supportive of him and witnessed it. John McGuire, Kennedy's radio man, was standing next to the young skipper in the cockpit when the Amagiri appeared from the darkness. McGuire reported in 1989 that he 
turned on keys to launch torpedoes, and that Kennedy signaled the engine room. Yet, he also claimed ignorance about what happened next, stating that, to this day, I don't know if McMahon signaled the engines, and apparently, he never made an effort to find out. Gerard Zinser, an engineer, also later claimed that Kennedy accelerated, even though he wasn't in the cockpit at the time like McGuire. Did Zinser actually witness Kennedy push the throttles, or did he just read or hear that he did? According to Joan and Clay Blair, the testimonies of the survivors were often questionable, since the men had narrated and repeated the same story so many times that they seemed incapable of distinguishing between what they saw or what they heard or read. So, did McGuire really witness Kennedy speeding up? It seems highly likely that he did. His position would certainly have allowed him to do so, and his uncertainty regarding what McMahon did with the signal suggests that he indeed saw the signal being transmitted. If JFK did increase speed, as Robinson asserts he privately confessed and his radio man publicly attested, and if this was the right action to take, why didn't he simply acknowledge it? There must be a strong reason, and the propensity to dodge accountability for McMahon's blunder definitely fits. Essentially, his denial to admit to speeding up saved both men from having to elucidate what went wrong. If the earlier supposition is accurate, Kennedy indirectly implied that McMahon erred by failing to open the flaps, a mistake he viewed as crucial to the collision. If it's also true that both Kennedy and McMahon purposely distorted the truth to hide this error, the ultimate deduction from Robinson's account is that the two men conspired. Hence, they colluded. There's a considerable amount of circumstantial evidence backing up this assertion, even though such evidence is entirely based on the aforementioned deductions and dependent on those conclusions. The most telling evidence might be McMahon's consistent reiteration of the same falsehood for so many years. He couldn't have confidently stuck to this lie unless he was certain that the person at the other end of the engine telegraph would back him up. If Kennedy had formally interrogated him about what transpired when he received the signal, feigning ignorance wouldn't have aided him. It was his duty to promptly respond to such signals, as they could be the difference between life and death. He would have been compelled to respond, and the truth would have been uncovered. Both men undeniably had much to gain from keeping the truth concealed. McMahon failed to adhere to procedure in a crisis situation that likely resulted in the sinking of his boat and the loss of two crew members. It's highly plausible that he would have faced disciplinary action, perhaps even a court-martial. The advantages for Kennedy are equally clear. He had deep regard for his crew. One potential gain from maintaining silence might have been to protect the severely wounded McMahon, who he might have perceived as having committed an unfortunate yet fatal error from the wrath of the Navy and perhaps more significantly from the anger of his fellow sailors. More selfishly, Kennedy was aware that he would bear the blame if a crew member erred under his command, possibly resulting in disciplinary action. Regardless of the Navy's official stance, Kennedy would have been deeply troubled by such a dismal performance. A lasting blot on his service record might not have mattered if he had intended to pursue a career as an electrician, but he harbored ambitions of a political career even possibly aiming for the presidency. Thus, keeping McMahon's failure under wraps would have been vital. Of course, this doesn't definitively establish the existence of such a conspiracy. What is now required is further concrete evidence that has thus far eluded researchers. One thing is certain, the debate over JFK's actions and McMahon's will continue. Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe. See you soon.